The American Liberty League, Sunday, December 9th, 1934. During the last week, there came to my desk copies of the promotional literature being used by the American Liberty League in securing new memberships. From a pamphlet entitled, American Liberty League, a statement of its principles and purchases, I glean this statement of their aims and ideals. The particular business and objects of the society shall be to defend and uphold the Constitution of the United States and to gather and disseminate information that one will teach the necessity of respect for the rights of persons and property as fundamental to every successful form of government, and two will teach the duty of government to encourage and protect individual and group initiative and enterprise, to foster the right to work, earn, save, and acquire property, and to preserve the ownership and lawful use of property when acquired. This is typical of the whole bundle of propaganda. The founders of the Liberty League make a patriotic salute to the Constitution, pledge themselves to defend and uphold it, and then immediately forget every other provision of the Constitution to concentrate on the right of ownership and the use of property. This fixation on property rights should be sufficient warning to the 71% of our people who are existing below the American standard of a decent living. Literally, my friends, that is all I can glean from a study of the Liberty League's promotional material in a folder entitled Why the American Liberty League. From the gifted pen of Juet Schuess, formerly the chairman of the Democratic National Committee, you will find a bit of philosophy of almost Aristotelian profundity. Mr. Schuess gives us the interpretation of what the um, Liberty League means by property rights. Listen to it attentively because the gifted frontman of the Liberty League has coined a new philosophy that was never preached in the circles of civilized men since the days of the Neros, the Vespians, and other emperors of slavery. Jouet says, It will be noted that the statement of principles links the rights of persons and property. There is a very good reason for the conjunction. In the view of those who comprise the membership of the League, the superficially drawn distinction between human rights and property rights is a catchphrase and nothing more. The two so-called categories of rights are inseparable in any society short of utopia or absolute communism. To protect a man's so-called human rights and strip him of his property rights would be to issue him a fishing license and then prohibit him from baiting his hook. That is the doctrine of Mr. Schuess and the so-called Liberty League. That is the doctrine which I said was neither preached nor practiced on the face of the earth since the days of the Neros and Vespasians. My friends, if that doctrine is sound, then all you citizens of the United States who do not own property have no rights as human beings, for Mr. Shu says that human rights and property rights are identical and inseparable. You who own no property, therefore, possess no human rights. You are an economic slave, a financial peon compared to whom the contemporaries of Uncle Tom, who immortalized the cabin, were freed men and brave. Well, that may be the belief of the millionaire leaders of the American Liberty League, but it was not the belief of the founders of this republic when, in the first session of the first Congress, they wrote the Ninth Amendment to the Constitution of the United States. The Ninth Amendment says, The enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. The doctrine of the Liberty Leaguers was therefore not the doctrine of those who founded this nation, insofar as they attempt to identify property rights and human rights, to such an extent that, if you lack the former, the latter must necessarily vanish into nothing. The doctrine of the Liberty Leaguers is not the doctrine of the Catholic Church. I say this for the benefit of Mr. Alfred E. Smith and Mr. John Raskob, and also for the benefit of any other Catholics who care to join the American Liberty League. 
Moreover, I say this without fear of contradiction from any person, high or low, cardinal or priest, who has spent at least a dozen hours of honest study on the doctrine of the Church as interpreted by Pius XI on this subject. Pope Pius XI wrote the encyclical Quadragesimo Anno. When the civil authority adjusts ownership to meet the needs of the public good, it acts not as an enemy, but as the friend of private owners, for thus it effectively prevents the possession of private property, intended by nature's author and his wisdom for the sustaining of human life, from creating intolerable burdens, and so rushing to its own destruction." In other words, the state can take away private property and should take away private property if for no other reason than to protect those who have too much property from the just wrath of those who have no property. Someone has said that there are two sides to every question, be he high or be he low, be he prince or be he pauper, there is only one side to this question. It is God's question, and it is God's side. You cannot be a scarlet-cloaked pussyfooter when the cries of downtrodden humanity, in their inarticulate form, are mounting above the platitudinous pronouncements of rhetorical spellbinders. Finally and emphatically, the belief of the Liberty Leaguers is not my belief. Witness the 16th principle of the National Union for Social Justice. I believe in preferring the sanctity of human rights to the sanctity of property rights. I believe that the chief concern of government shall be for the poor because, as it is witnessed, the rich have ample means of their own to care for themselves. Be not deceived, my friends, by the lip service which the divisors of the Liberty League pay at the shrine of the Constitution. Such principles as the one I have quoted from Mr. Schuess reveal the terrifying clarity what is in their hearts. The Declaration of Independence blazoned forever on the record of civilization that all men are endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is the primary duty of government to preserve these rights. The founders of this government wrote the Constitution expressly to promote the general welfare. But it is a strange, narrow, dangerous form of liberty that is outlined by the League which has assumed her glorious name. To those who wish to identify themselves with Am the American Liberty League, Mr. Shu sends a little bronze button about the size of a dime. On its face is stamped the replica of the Liberty Bell that once sounded the vibrant tones of independence when our American forefathers protested against the so-called property rights of a George III. Across the front of this Liberty Bell are the letters A-L-L, -L, which inadvertently spell the word ALL. All for the rich and none for the poor. All for the concentrators of wealth and the dregs of life's bitter chalice for the dispossessed and unemployed. All for the international bankers and only the crumbs that they drop from their table for the rest of us. On the day when the lineal ancestors of the American Liberty Leaguers violated our Constitution and handed over the right to coin and regulate money to private individuals despite the doctrine which proclaimed that Congress and Congress alone has the right to coin and regulate money, on that day the Liberty Bell, now solemnly hanging in Philadelphia, was cracked and its joyous notes of liberty were silenced. Alas, poor Liberty Bell, the clarion purity of your original melody is no more. Cracked and discordant, today you are a fit symbol for DuPonts, the Raskobs, and the rest of 
them as they have the frontery to use you in perpetuating a financial and industrial system which is pauperizing the people of this land. If the founders of the American Liberty League have the common honesty not only to protect our Constitution, but to restore the coinage and regulation of money to Congress as the Constitution demands, I will gladly join them and proudly wear their button of the Liberty Bell. These defenders of property rights, even at the expense of human rights, are seeking a membership of not less than one million persons. Are those who are in opposition to the American Liberty League willing to permit the National Union for Social Justice to be outdone either in number or in moral support? It is yours to decide and yours to act. To show you more intimately and concretely for what the American Liberty League really stands, let me tell you the sordid truth of their General Mortars Corporation holdings of which the DuPont family, the guardian angel of the American Liberty League, owns and controls 24%. In the year 1933, the DuPont family took as profits, in the shape of dividends, out of the General Motors stock, enough money to sustain 16,250 families at a living wage of $1,500 a year each. In the four years of the Depression, the same DuPont family, for whom the Raskobs and Shooses and Smiths are but the dressed-up frontmen and spokesmen, took the astronomical amount of $97,780,560 profits out of General Motors from their ownership of 24% of its stock. This was enough money to sustain 16,296 families, over a period of four years at $1,500 a family. This does not count the profits this family took from their many other holdings in various other corporations. This is the unanswerable argument. One American Capitalistic Liberty League family takes out of profits from its corporations the equivalent of a living wage for 16,296 families for 80,000 persons now regimented in the bread lines of destitution. They talk of property rights when human rights have been trampled by their advance. This, my friends, indicates the kind of property rights which they wish to preserve. In plainer language, they wish to preserve the racketeering by which they concentrate wealth in the hands of a few privileged ones. They wish to preserve the present industrial setup by which the years of 1930, 1931, 1932, and 1933, the General Motors, with a net income of $331 million, succeeded in paying dividends of $407 million and more to the stockholders. That is embroidered bookkeeping. Mark ye well then those that wear the symbol of the cracked liberty bell with the letters all written across its surface. It is the symbol of those who wish to preserve want in the midst of plenty and the unconstitutional setup of our present financial system. They are the modern Tories who prefer the racketeering of a George the Third to the liberty as propounded and fought for by a Washington.